Great. Thank you very much. Um, I was taking furious notes during Lindy's talk, so I now need to refocus um, and tell you a little bit about um, what we've been measuring with spectroscopy um, and what that might be able to tell us about learning and um, plasticity in vivo in the human. So the first thing then is why on earth might we want to measure this? Why um, everything anybody knows from you know, basic neurophysiology 101 is that plasticity is glutamatergic, surely. So why should we care about GABA in this context? Um, I'll then cover a little bit of the literature about motor learning, where this has been studied most in, in humans. I'll go on to talk a little bit about some work around um, looking at learning outside the motor system, particularly perceptual learning. We'll then go on to talk a little bit about long-term plasticity um, and some evidence as to whether the kind of things that we're seeing um, in the short-term studies that tend to be what we perform are still present long-term and there's still some um, significant questions around that. And then a little bit towards causality. I'm not for a second going to get there, um, but cover a couple of ideas um, that are around in the literature where people are beginning to get towards it. Um, and hopefully with the idea that you will um, can take something from those studies and go away and, as Lindy says, do the next experiments um, and work out how much closer we can get to trying to pin down um, whether or not what we're measuring with GABA, uh, with GABA spectroscopy is actually telling us what we want it to tell us um, and whether we can get to the point when we um, know whether or not GABA is causal for plasticity. Okay. So, a little backtrack. So, why on earth would we begin to think that GABA changes might be important in plasticity? There are an absolute ton of papers that I could um, start off with, but I've edited it down for the interest of time. Um, and I'm going to start off with just one. So the first thing I'm going to do is show you this, which is a slice through the cat motor cortex. Um, and in green are the pyramidal output neurons, um, but in red is a stain for GAD, the enzyme that produces GABA. And so these are the GABAergic interneurons. And Lindy's made the point um, very beautifully, and I'd just like to echo that, that you know they, they, we, we obsess about glutamatergic neurons, but actually GABA is a widely distributed, beautifully diverse set of interneurons that have really complex effects on glutamatergic firing. Um, and uh, the multiplicity of different types and the very specific synaptic patterns that they seem to produce allows us to think, perhaps, that GABA is a really, really specific and sensitive way by which the brain can modulate ongoing activity. I'm going to talk about some basic ooh, neurophysiology. So this is um, some um, long-term potentiation induction in a freely moving rodent. Um, this was work done um, 20 years ago now, gosh. And what they did is a very standard um, LTP experiment. They stimulated presynaptically and recorded postsynaptically. And for a given input, um, if you don't do anything, you get a fairly consistent output. What they then did at the um, dotted line is induce long-term potentiation like plasticity in the cortex, so um, tetanically stimulate presynaptically and postsynaptically to strengthen those synapses. And that develops a little bit in the freely moving rodent, but you can see that you get very standard LTP induction, where for a um, consistent input, you now get a much stronger output for the postsynaptic cell. Okay, so classic neurophysiological demonstration of synaptic plasticity in action. The interesting thing about this study is they then went on to do that exactly the same experiment in the presence of a GABA agonist, so a, GABA, a drug that increases GABA concentration, and what they saw was absolutely no effect at all. Okay. So this doesn't mean that um, synaptic plasticity is a GABAergic process. It isn't. Um, there are entire journals dedicated to NMDA receptors, to glutamate, to AMPA, to the very complex things surrounding glutamatergic Plasticity. But what it might suggest is that a decrease in GABA allows an increase in cell firing and therefore acts as a gating mechanism by which glutamatergic LTP-like plasticity might occur. And that idea has spawned, has spawned a number of studies in the literature um, trying to unpick that 
um, and see how far we can get to use that idea to look at different aspects of plasticity. So this all started off um, really in the motor learning field. There are a number of reasons for that, um, but uh, mainly that it's really easy to do, to, um, do most learning of motor skills. Um, most of this work is um, done at 7 Tesla now, um, and we've heard about the reasons for that. Um, those I'll be dipping back and forth between different um, scanners, different sites, different field strengths. So there was a, um, a study, gosh, about 15 years ago now um, from Oxford, before my time, um, where they performed a motor learning task and showed a decrease in GABA during motor learning. For various reasons, that was, that was the first demonstration of dynamic changes in GABA, but for various reasons, it had been quite difficult to replicate. So um, very recently, um, James Kalasinski, who's now down in Cardiff, um, and my group tried to um, look at the question of if GABA decreases are important to allow plasticity to occur. If we do something that induces plasticity, and in this case, this was a serial reaction time task, it's a motor learning task. We asked our subjects to um, learn a 16 button press sequence that repeated and repeated and repeated over time. We know that that induces plasticity um, in the left primary motor cortex as people learn that task. And so the question was, in that context of plasticity induction, can we see decreases in GABA? I put this up because it's a, um, because I know it quite well, but also because it illustrates some of the issues um, that are really important when we're trying to study um, plasticity in any context. So we've got our condition here, the first group where they were indeed learning this motor sequence learning task, and unsurprisingly, people are capable of learning which button comes next um, in a sequence task if you pay them enough and put them in a scanner for long enough. But we were interested in seeing decreases in GABA, and the first three talks um, this afternoon will have um, hopefully given you a few ideas as to why you might see a change in GABA that has absolutely nothing to do with whether or not people are inducing plasticity. Okay. So we were worried that you might see a, um, a change in GABA if you get frequency drift, if you increase movement by you know, doing some movement um, and you decrease the quality of your scan. So it's really important to have a condition that is um, matched as closely as possible to the one that you're interested in, to the learning condition, in every respect apart from the fact it doesn't have the learning component. Okay? So in this, exactly the same condition, but instead of there being a um, sequence to learn, there were some random button presses. There was also um, a time, um, time in the scanner condition where people just watched a David Attenborough nature film and didn't do anything else to make sure we weren't um, being biased by any overall drifts in the data. And what we saw was, luckily, which is why we're here, um, that we, um, over six blocks of five minutes of spectroscopy, our GABA measurement decreases in the left primary motor cortex as subjects learn the task, but not when they're just moving their fingers or when they're just lying at rest, trying not to fall asleep. Okay. So we have a specific decrease in GABA in the brain region we think is doing the learning during learning of that task. Can we go any further with that? Well, we can start to look at relationships between um, GABA levels in that first block and see if they predict how much people learn on a subject-by-subject -subject basis, and indeed they do. And we can start looking at neurochemical specificity, and we can do exactly the same analysis and say, is this just true of inhibition excitation in the brain? Do we, um, is this just something to do with how much neurotransmitter there is in general? Or is this something very specific about the amount of inhibition that's in the brain? And so we tend to use glutamate as our neurochemical control, because um, it seems like quite a sensible one to us. Um, and we see a relationship here whereby GABA concentration early on, on a subject-by-subject -subject basis, predicts how much you learn but that is not true of glutamate. 
So those kind of studies have been done a few times and have found very similar things. As I say, motor learning is a really easy way of looking at learning because you can measure the amount of learning really easily. You can get reaction times and they behave really nicely. But people are interested um, in brain areas outside the primary motor cortex. So I stand here as somebody who's not quite sure why, but apparently people are. Um, and so one of the big questions we might have is, OK, there's a lot of evidence that um, GABA might be important for learning of um, motor skills. But do we think it might be important for learning of things that aren't motor skills? And this might be particularly relevant in primary sensory areas where it's at least plausible that inhibition might interact with learning in different ways. So this is work um, done by some colleagues of ours in Cambridge, um, by Polly, who is there, so please feel free to ask her if there are any technical questions, um, um, that they um, very um, kindly did in Oxford, and we had a lot of fun doing it. Um, and the question they really had, they're a vision group, and they were very interested in the relationship between GABA and learning of various perceptual tasks. And being very clever, they had two tasks, and they had very clear hypotheses about what should happen to the GABA. So, they had a, so these are the, the um, original um, prototype stimuli, and the task, as far as the subjects were concerned, was to see these and say whether the dots were basically aligned radially or concentrically. But they mixed them up a bit, and they made them quite difficult to do. So there was one task where they took those stimuli, but they um, mixed it up with a lot of noise. And the hypothesis there would be as people improve in being able to distinguish between these two types of stimuli, um, they might do that by decreasing their GABA levels because you want to get all the information you possibly can to allow you to pick out the relevant stuff. They also had a, um, a feature differences task where they were very interested in looking at very specific differences uh, between these. And they had the hypothesis there that in order to distinguish important features that might allow you to tell which type of stimuli it was, you might want to put your GABA up, okay? Reduce the noise and look very specifically at the signal. These are the behavioral um, results, they do a lot of trials. This was not a fun experiment to be a subject in. We're very, very grateful to them all. Um, and you can see over time, people get better at being able to correctly identify these stimuli, so they can learn it. This is a particularly nice experiment because um, not only did we have a control neurotransmitter, but actually they had a control voxel. So we did simultaneous acquisitions where we, they were interested in lateral occipital cortex, which was where we thought this learning would happen, and in the posterior parietal cortex, where um, as a site that is involved in this kind of signal processing but wasn't hypothesized to be the site at which learning should occur. And these are the results. What they saw was exactly what they predicted, such that um, in the signal-to-noise task where you might imagine you want to decrease your GABA to maximize the information available to you to make that discrimination, we saw, we saw a, um, a significant decrease in GABA, whereas um, a condition where you might want to increase your GABA to reduce that noise and really look for the salient features, there was a significant increase. That um, split was specific to the region that they hypothesized it might be. Um, but we, don't, we did see a, um, a sort of increase in GABA in the other um, voxel. We often see that. Um, I'm very interested to discuss and get a view on what people think that might be. Um, I wonder whether it's um, alertness and attention in the, quarter, in the um, scanner. It's um, a pretty dull environment, even doing this kind of stuff. Um, and these changes were indeed specific to GABA. There was absolutely no change in glutamate um, in the occipital temporal cortex. They went on to look um, and see if this again, um, like in the context of the motor system, whether or not um, we could relate the change in GABA to the behavioral improvement with the idea that if this really is doing something and allowing us to learn these tasks, then you might imagine that people who can decrease their GABA a lot are going to do really well at learning it, which indeed they do, and people who really aren't doing very much down here um, really aren't learning it very well. And the interesting thing was we saw that increase in GABA in the feature differences task. It's difficult to know whether that's just a time effect or whether that's a task effect, but 
speaking very strongly to the idea it's a task effect, there is a, um, a highly significant relationship in the other direction, such that in this task, where you want people to put their GABA up to get better, people who do get a lot better, people who um, don't or even decrease their GABA actually really don't learn. So this is not a phenomenon that's restricted to the primary motor areas. It seems to happen in primary sensory areas. But we shall see whether this works. Um, learning is not just restricted to the period of time in which you're doing the task. Right? So anybody who's learnt anything, so if you've learnt to play a piano piece, you will know that you learn it and you kind of get okay at it. Um, and then um, you um, go away and you come back and you're better at it. Okay, so we have a learning phase and we have a memory stabilisation phase or consolidation phase where um, things that um, you have learnt then get stabilised and those synapses get stabilised. And so the question then is what happens, do you think, to GABA during memory stabilisation? Um, does it carry on decreasing? Does it increase? Or does it stay much the same? And I have one, well, either everybody's right, I haven't got an N on this. I'm going to assume that you're all very intelligent and paying attention, because that is entirely right. Thank you very much. Can we go back to the um, slides, please? So, yes, absolutely. You might expect that if you get a decrease in inhibition that allows these um, synapses to become quite um, labile, once you've got the right synaptic activities, um, they then get consolidated, stabilised, by an increase in inhibition. So this is work um, done... Um, over in state by Watanabe's group um, in a really neat design. And what they did was another visual task um, where task one, they asked people to um, try and work out what angle there was on a visual grating. And it was very difficult to see the visual grating, so people concentrated on it and learnt it. But they got better at doing that. They then wasted a little bit and did another task that was extremely similar. Okay? Um, and the idea being that if you do two tasks, if you learn one thing and then you learn another thing in close succession and they rely on the same brain mechanisms, then learning of task two will basically remove the learning of task one. And they looked at that um, by looking at the, um, how much memory there was on day two compared with how good people were the task before they did it. They had another condition where they spent much longer learning task one, they call this overlearning. So they learnt it and learnt it and learnt it to the point that the um, behaviour had stopped improving and then they carried on, so they stabilised that memory and did exactly the same contrast. In the condition, as you would expect, with no overlearning, if you look at the um, behaviour improvement here compared with beforehand, you, um, on the first train session you actually get a decrement, no real change because you've wiped out this learning with learning of the second task. But in the overtrained condition, behaviorally, they demonstrated that they had stabilization of that memory, such that even if you then learn a second task, you don't learn it very well, and actually that first memory is maintained. Okay. So we've got two conditions whereby that memory, the memory of the first task has been lost completely, and the second one where that memory trace was stabilized um, before the introduction of the second task. So we've got stabilisation of synapses. So they did exactly the same thing and just looked at GABA levels before and after, either just learning the task or really overlearning and stabilising that intervention. This is the um, normal condition. These, <laughs> one of the delights of the GABA literature is that everybody plots it in different ways. So this is an excitation inhibition balance. The excitation doesn't really change. Um, so an increase in this basically means um, a decrease in GABA. So this is a decrease in GABA. This is an increase in GABA. And if you learn a task, as hopefully you are not surprised by now, you see a decrease in GABA. However, if you've overlearned that task and you've stabilised it, and they know they've stabilised it behaviourally, they see an increase in GABA representing that stabilisation. Okay. Um, so it matters what stage of learning you're looking at. Are you looking at the short-term acquisition and the active acquisition of behaviour, or are you looking at what happens after that if there's no behavioural improvement, but you go to stabilise and consolidate that information. 
So that was looking at short-term learning, but looking at what happens after you've learnt it and looking at consolidation of that learning. The other situation that we see a lot and we might be interested in is um, what happens to neurochemicals during longer-term learning of plas and plasticity. Most of the skills that we're actually interested are not in are not things that we learn over half an hour, are things that we learn over days, weeks, months, and years. And so um, work done in Oxford by um, colleagues of mine um, looked at learning of a complex vision motor skill over some weeks um, by teaching undergraduates to juggle. Okay. Um, this was a lot of fun. They had a lot of um, entertainment doing it. Um, but actually it is, if anyone has learnt to juggle, it is a complex skill, but one that pretty much anyone can acquire if you do enough of it. This is the um, experimental design. They did a baseline session. We did lots of imaging, including spectroscopy. They then went away and trained 15 minutes a day for six weeks and got better. They then came back, had another spectroscopy scan, had four weeks of not juggling, um, and then had another scan. This is the um, behaviour, so these are ratings, and you can see that people, um, we're interested particularly in the low intensity group, I won't go into the high intensity group here, um, got better over these training days, um, and they got, most of them learnt to juggle pretty proficiently actually. These are the GABA levels, and what you can see is at baseline, um, and then you get a decrease in GABA during the learning. What happens, though, after you stop learning is that it goes back to baseline. Okay? So you get this decrease in learning, uh, decrease in GABA during active learning, but once it has, um, that learning has actually finished um, and you have a short period of consolidation, probably that's a few hours, and then um, if you don't use that skill again, actually, as you might imagine, your inhibition returns pretty much to baseline. This is still a very, very open question, though, because um, there is also um, some work done by Jakob Blicher, who um, was interested in relearning and relearning of motor skills after stroke. So if any of you have seen a patient who's had a stroke, people um, often lose a lot of function and will recover that function over days, weeks, and months, and years. And so we can think of it as a sort of um, in vivo clinical way of looking at long-term plasticity. And so he did exactly this, and he looked at GABA levels in the left primary, in the affected primary motor cortex in patients with subcortical strokes, and just asked the question, if this is a marker of long-term plasticity, do they have lower GABA levels than people who, um, who haven't had a stroke? Which is exactly what he saw. Um, so this is not due to the fact that there's a lesion in this um, voxel. There isn't, um, and they have co corrected appropriately for um, atrophy and other measures. This is a genuine decrease in um, GABA levels in the patients, potentially, hypothetically, potentially, um, representing a long-term um, induction of plasticity to support motor skills. Why do you see a um, difference between the juggling study and here? I don't know. It would be a very interesting study to look at. We would suggest, and I would suggest anyway, that the patients here are still learning. They're still improving. It may be quite slow by these points. These are months or years after their stroke, but they're still learning. They're still actively engaged, and they're, they're still active plasticity induction um, and plasticity maintenance pro um, mechanisms occurring in their primary motor cortex, whereas in the juggling study, that has been um, finished, they're no longer allowed to learn it, um, and therefore things have returned. But that is a um, hypothesis that needs testing. Okay. So for the last five minutes or so, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about um, one of my um, interests. Um, and something that I hope might spark a little bit of interest in a few people here, um, which is the use of non-invasive brain stimulation approaches um, to determine um, causality. Okay, so non-invasive brain stimulation is a useful way 
could do this by a show of hands, um, by which we can get around the fact that MR is inherently a correlational um, modality, and that's true for anything you'll see in the next few days. And really, if we want to know whether something is causal, we need to interfere with it um, and see what effect that has. Ooh. That's exciting. Yes, excellent. Okay. Um, and you can do that in a number of ways. <laughs> um, but one of the um, appealing ones in humans, anyway, is non-invasive brain stimulation. People do this in a number of ways. The work I'm going to talk about um, in the next two studies is using um, transcranial direct current stimulation, whereby um, we apply a one milliamp current to the brain region. Oh, excellent. Know about this, this is brilliant. Um, I like this. Is, when it works, this is good. Um, we apply a one milliamp current to the brain region that we're interested in um, to see, um, to manipulate ongoing activity there and see what effects that might have. Great. So if I can go back to the slide. So we use transcranial direct current stimulation. There are lots of other things to do. And this is the montage that we use. We have an um, a electrode over the left primary motor cortex um, and a reference electrode. And we were very interested in whether or not inducing plasticity exogenously by using non-invasive brain stimulation might have similar effects on GABA to inducing it endogenously by things like learning. And... Um, Indeed, it does, such that um, if you use anodal TDCS, which we know induces LTP-like plasticity in the underlying cortex and is an excitatory stimulation, we see a significant reduction in GABA after about 10 minutes of stimulation um, of about, um, in the order of about 10%, which is about what we see when we do a learning study. So that's great, and we've run with that, and we've done lots of brain stimulation studies that I won't bore you with. But one of the things we thought about and had been bothering us for a while was we see this GABA decrease with learning, but can we get any way to saying that we think it might be causal or whether it might be an epiphenomenon? And one of the ways that we thought about doing it is a, um, a study in some young, healthy people. And we, what we did was do anodal TDCS, the left primary motor cortex, on one day and measure, on a subject-by-subject -subject basis, how responsive their GABAergic systems were, so how much their GABA decreased in response to stimulation. We did a control voxel, um, which showed nothing, as you would hope. And then on the third day, we did a motor learning task, so a reaction time task, as before, um, during functional imaging. And this design asked, allowed us to ask the question, can we relate, on a subject-by-subject -subject basis, how good people are at learning to how much their GABA decreases when we um, induce plasticity. Okay. And if GABA decreases are this sort of gating mechanism, then there should be a specific relationship between those two things. So we calculated our learning measure just by the decrease in reaction times, um, as we usually do. And what we saw, as you might imagine in this talk, is a significant relationship. So people who were very, uh, had very responsive GABAergic systems for whatever reason were also those who learnt quite well. People who didn't really modulate their GABA didn't really learn very much. So it's not causal, but it's a little way towards suggesting that this might be an important mechanism. Um, and you can look on the fMRI signal, and actually that relationship between the learning-related fMRI signal and the um, MR spectroscopy decreasing GABA is um, very, very specific to the um, left primary motor cortex, where we think that learning is happening. So it's a way that we might start to actually relate these things. I'm going to finish with what is a slightly complicated study um, by colleagues of mine in Oxford, um, but is a very, very clever way of looking at the role of GABA in learning. What they did was get people to um, get a scanner and, they, and, you, and learn these associations. So they um, asked people to learn that if you saw stimulus A, you would expect it to, the next stimulus to be stimulus B. Okay, and if you learnt C, you'd expect the next one to be D. So they learnt these pairs, arbitrary pairs of stimuli. Um, 
And they relied on a, um, a property of the brain that is that it gets um, a stimulus repetition. So it gets bored if it sees the same thing twice. And if you really learn these um, uh, pairs, then the activity you expect to see on the second stimulus is much less if the preceding stimulus is the one that pairs with it. So if you have A and then B, the brain knows that it's expecting B and doesn't get very excited about it, and the bold response is quite small. If you have A and then C, the brain isn't expecting it, and you get a much bigger response. Okay? So it's a slightly weird way of looking at learning, but it allows you to quantify how well learned these associations are. So they did a very complicated design where they did exactly that. They trained these associations, and then they looked at those responses, and what they saw was that um, you get this uh, difference in response to the res expected stimulus early on when you've just learnt it. But actually, once, like the overlearning condition, once you've learnt it for a while, actually it goes away and there's no difference. If you imagine that we get an increase in excitability in our brains every time you learn something, we're going to be all over the place. Um, so this then disappeared. What they then did on the second day was test this again and showed, um, um, and then did anodal TDCS um, to decrease the inhibition, um, which indeed it did. And so what they then saw was that on day one, you have this learning trace, and actually that then disappears. Okay. It's still not there on day two. You've learnt it. There's nothing going on, much like the um, juggling study. They've learnt it. They're not learning anything anymore. The fMRI um, signature of learning has disappeared. But what they then did was use um, anodal TDCS to decrease the GABA, and suddenly this learning trace reappears, and the degree to which it reappears is related to the GABA. So what they took from this um, is that not only are there glutamatergic traces, uh, there are new synapses being formed in glutamatergic synapses that support this learning, but that actually after that, there are also anti-memories. So similar circuit changes happening in the GABAergic neurons that um, then renormalize the excitatory and hereditary balance. But then if you get rid of those by decreasing the um, GABA, you get that re-emergence and revisibility of the glutamatergic memories. So I hope that I've um, persuaded you that either GABA is important or GABA changes are important for plasticity and learning in humans in a range of situations. An MRS, if used carefully, and we've heard a lot about the things you might want to think about when designing experiments, can tell us about human plasticity across multiple regions, domains, and timescales. And if you combine it with other imaging modalities, behavior, or invasive methods, we can really start to get a little bit closer towards examining causality. Thank you very much.